about to start. Before we begin, we are making some changes to this Igniting Voice. Um, we will not be going up and presenting one by one. Instead, we will be um, doing a mock trial performance. And we will be using the different presentations as evidence for the mock trial. We are putting Lady Baltimore on trial for <coughs> bias. And everybody in the audience will be the jury. So have fun with that. And I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> And I'm Ella Cunningham Murray. Welcome back to another episode of GSM Sports Network, the news news network, the sports segment. Today we will be covering several sports, starting with hockey. But first off, we are going to be a new be doing a new segment we like to call Do Children's House Students Have a Gender or Race Bias About Sports? We call it DCHSHAGRBAS for short. <laughs> We have interviewed fans ages two to six about our top four hockey players and to see how many goals they thought the players would score. Then we tallied everything up and here are the results. In last place, we have, drum roll please. The white female comes in last place with a total of 47 points. Coming up next, we have white male with a total of 70 points. And last but not least, ladies and gentlemen, we have a tie! 
you're hearing that right, folks. It's a tie with each having a total of 80 points. We have black female and black male. Incredible, and they won by 10 whole points. What an upset. I've never seen anything like it in my entire life. Okay, moving on to swimming. It works the same way as hockey, except we asked the fans how many laps they could swim versus how many goals they could score. Coming in last place with a record-breaking low score of only 18, we have black female. Wow, that is low, especially considering that our third place swimmer has a total of 36 laps. That is a substantial difference. <laughs> okay, we're going to try and speed through these next few ones now. The runner-up is black male and with 55 makes, laps. And that makes our number one swimmer another record breaker of 95 points, white male. Okay, next up we have our karate people. I actually don't know what you're supposed to call someone who does karate or whatever. This time we asked students how many boards they thought they could break. This category was probably the closest one we've had. Let's start things off in last place where we have black male with 53 boards, which if I'm not mistaken is the highest last place we have. That you are not mistaken. <laughs> Moving on to third, we have white female with 65 boards and in second we have black female with 74 boards. That means our number one spot goes to white male with 81 boards. And with that, we move on to our last category of the day, basketball. Ooh. Last place goes to white female who scored 38 points. Next up is black male with 67 points, white fe black female with 72 points, and for the third time in a row, white male wins, only by one point with a total of 73. This has been interesting. Have you noticed any trends in the data on it? I have, Ella. White male has won three out of four of the categories, only losing in hockey. Also, while we were taking data, I noticed that white female was the only one to have one one in every category. Have you seen any patterns? I noticed that the swimming category was the most irregular, which had both the lowest and highest scores, which I thought was pretty interesting. It looks to me like Children's House stu students really do have a bias toward white males in sports at this early age. I agree, but I think it depends on the sport. For example, I think that hockey shows more of a bias towards African Americans. Okay, well that pretty much wraps it up. See you next time on the GSM News Channel, the sports segment. <laughs>
and some of our shapes were associated with a certain thing or action that may have caused a more severe answer. For the questions with age, most people associated a fuller or more curvy body with an older age. When we questioned athletic ability, way more people chose the skinnier or smaller object over the fuller. The eating habits question was who eats more candy, and most people chose the fuller body, but it was still less than we expected. We think people do hold these stereotypes that are associated with age, eating habits, and athletic ability. These stereotypes impact our world and culture because they could be hurtful to others that may associate with a stereotype. These are hurtful by assuming something about someone that may not be true. In our experience, we have learned to not stereotype people based on their body because we know how painful it might feel to others. Here is our data result. So this one, um, we implied age, older age, normally means you could be retired. So we did a fuller body, and most people chose the pig. This next question also had to do with fuller body. Um, as you can tell by the data results, um, our hypothesis was true that more people chose the curvier body. That's associated with older people. For this one, it was um, athletic ability, and most people, most people did choose the smaller object over the larger one. This one was a distraction so that the kids wouldn't find out what we were doing. This one was more with gender. We looked up um, certain shapes that associate with the different genders, and we found a cone for male and pair for female. Most people, this was an error because most people didn't know what the cone was, so they automatically chose the pair because they knew what it was. This next one was who likes candy. This one could have also been an error because when you look at this question, you might be able to get out what we were trying to get out of them. So that was kind of an error, but as you can tell by the stereotype, it was true. This one was for a model, it was very close, and we also didn't consider plus size models. This one is which, more, which, which one is more likely to yell at someone. This was also an error because the diamond kind of shape was a little bit tricky, and some people didn't know what the other object was, which was a pen, so. This one was another distraction. This one was who was a track star. Um, as you can tell by the data results, there were a lot more that chose the smaller object. Um, but this could have also been an error because a lot of people associate rockets with being fast. Thank you. Thank you.
Um, we recorded the ages, the amount of people, and filtered out their answers to determine if they were considered girly or not. Anyone who answered something that was considered girly would be placed into the girly category. 61% of the whole group were not considered girly, and the other 39% were, did fell into the girly category. There was a total of 62 interviews. 26 were male and 37 were female. On the female graph, 20 females were considered gender neutral and 17 were considered girly. On the male graph, everyone was considered gender neutral. And according to our data, we have concluded that most people who we interviewed were indeed not girly. Thank you. I would now like to call to the stand Ayala Mingo and her research on cultural appropriation. My name is Nayala Mingo. Today, I'm here to present what cultural appropriation is and provide examples. Cultural appropriation is the adaptation of elements of one culture by members of another culture. This can be controversial when members of a dominant culture appropriate from disadvantaged minority cultures. For example, do you really think Taco Bell was created by a Mexican person? It was created by a white man who was a World War II chef. More than half the items on Taco Bell's menu would taste 100% different if you were to have them in Mexico. This is bad because white people are profiting off of Mexican culture. Another example would be lacrosse. Lacrosse has its origins in a tribal game played by Eastern Woodlands Native Americans. The game was excessively modified by European colonizers to North America to create its current professional form. Um, for centuries and centuries, black hairstyles, especially cornrows and afros, were deemed as low class and unprofessional. Until one time in 1979 in the movie Tang, a white actress by the name of Bo Derek wore straight back cornrows with beads running down the beach. From that day on, there were increasingly more amounts of white hair salons that started to do what they called Bo Derek braids. This is problematic because it just brushes black culture out of the way. In the, plus, in the past, black people could get denied jobs for wearing their hair this way, but when white people do it, it becomes a trend. Don't think stuff like that only happened in the 70s, because it happens now. Next slide. Um, so over there, um, those are like what you would call like cornrows or like double dutch braids, but um, since like a lot of uh, white people started to do it, they called it boxer braids, like they changed the name. And over there, that's Woe Vicky, she's an Instagram star. Um, Woe Vicky, she's white, but she thinks she's black, and she does a lot of stuff so that people would think she's black, and that's um, it's like something for Party City, the people with the sound burrows, um, and that's the cross. Uh, that lady has a Native American like, head thing on, that's cultural appropriation, and Panda Express is not real um, Chinese cuisine, and Taco Bell, not real Mexican. Thank you. Shop, much less be a surgeon. 
Without a good job, you can't get good health insurance. And without good health insurance, you can't always get the medications and devices you need. Also, how does race affect the pay, people, the pay of people with one loss? Have you ever thought of that? Because if you're black and you have a disability, then you might not get a good pay. And the fact that there, and the fact that only one in four African Americans with disabilities are employed, as compared to African Americans without disabilities who are employed. If you're a person who is white and doesn't have a leg, then you might not get, a, then you might not even get a job at McDonald's, and your payment will not be good. But if you're a person of color, then your payments will probably be even worse. And the number of limb, limb, limb amputations per day is 507. That's a pretty big number. And by 2050, there will be 3.6 million people in the U.S. who will not have a limb, well, either if it was by birth or if it was an amputation. And to this day, limb loss and race play a big role in your pay. And here are my proposals, proposed solutions. I think that instead of people without a limb getting a lower pay, they should get a higher pay. Because the medical, and the medical care and the surgeries cost a lot and they, need to be, and they need to be able to afford them without being put more in debt. And they also need to be, a, be able to afford the prosthetics so they can at least do half or more of the work that people with all four limbs can do. Also taxes should be lower for people without limbs so they can, so, so they can save up for the stuff they would need. Overall, limb law should be given more attention, care, and awareness. Racism and misogyny haven't disappeared. There are still issues worth fighting for. Your Honor, I call to the stand to see a ballast to explain further. Um, I will be giving a speech on intersectional feminism. I did this speech because I believe it's important for equality to be the social norm and not a radical idea. In America, there have been three waves of feminism. The current is the third, and it is different for one very important and impactful reason. Third wave feminism includes, it includes the LGBTQ community and women of color. Feminism is almost a synonym for equality. This has not been true in the past. The first wave was driven by upper class white women to vote. The second wave then separated itself from lesbians, so they wouldn't be called men haters, and its face was the young white woman. And in the third wave, we are simply calling society to wake up and get equality for all. The term intersectional feminism was coined in 1989 by Kimberly Crenshaw, an African American woman and now the leading scholar in critical race theory, who showed how misogyny and racism were combined and how they were at the, and African American women were at the intersection of women and color and subjected to both bigotry, but were slightly ignored in the um, vice in slightly ignored because of the race or gender and vice versa movement. This is why intersectional feminism is so important. It validates each experience into one movement for equality. The term was coined to title the oppression received by African American women. It has grown to mean anyone who is too of the discriminated. Fighters against implicit, bi implicit disadvantages are called feminism. feminists. Their common denominator is the experience bigotry no matter the kind. In the past, people have ignored the call for help because it didn't Fit their agenda. I will not. I will cut off my right arm. Of, I will cut off this right arm of mine before I ever work or demand the ballot of a Negro and not the woman," said famed suffragette leader Susan B. Anthony. This showed that African American women didn't fit in the first wave of women's rights. Civil rights activist Bernard Lee said about Martin Luther King Jr. Martin was absolutely a male chauvinist. He believed that the wife should stay home and take care of the babies while he'd be out in the streets. This shows that African-American women's rights as women weren't supported in the African-American liberation. Today, intersectionality is sewed into our movements. Women's March is an organization dedicated to the transformative social change of the 21st century and women's rights. It is also a writer of the third wave of feminism. It thrives on intersectionality. It states that it is for all women, black women, indigenous women, poor women, immigrant women, disabled women, Jewish women, Muslim women, Latinx women, I, Asian and Pacific Islander women, lesbian, bi, queer, and trans women. It states that women's rights are human rights and then that LGBTQ rights are human rights. There are some, typically white women, 
who refute this feminism and almost dismiss people of color's experience. They defend it like it's a personal attack, claiming that it doesn't apply to them. They stop the supporting the movement if they're not in the limelight. This is not intersectional feminism. This is intersectional feminism of their opponent. Toxic feminism is they believe themselves to be the starless of equality. They refuse the fact that their philosophy not philosophy might not be aligned with intersectional feminism, but our title shouldn't change our principles. Please continue the fight for equality even if the limelight isn't on you. It is not a fight for the right to be called an intersectional feminist, it's the fight for equality and justice. The title intersectional feminism feminist isn't for everyone. To be an intersectional feminism, you have to make sure you practice it, not just toxic feminism, which looks more like first wave feminist, feminism. But intersectional feminism is still the fight for equality for all. It is the one that today needs. We must bring equality to actuality. Discriminating against people is in the past. The future is coming with equality and justice. But all, all in all, this movement is good. The fact that we are now not fighting for the rights of one people, but fighting for the rights of all people is a tremendous step forward. It shows how our consciousness has grown. We need to stay like this. We cannot go back to fighting bigotry on one, fighting bigotry power on one level, but remain passive to the other level the bigger reigns. We cannot fight misogyny without highlighting the worst hardships of the women of color experience. Now we are intertwined and we need to stand up for everyone or nothing will change. Taking two steps forward with our other legs still in chains is not progress. This is our third wave. The culmination of fighting for rights has come out with this beauty to beat back oppression and bigotry. This is intersectional feminism, created by a black woman, but applicable to many. It is here to create equality. Welcome it. Welcome it. Do not starve this justice bringer. Equality will, be, will prevail and the justice will be here for all. I'm going to give you a basic definition of what code switching really is. Code switching is a way that people alternate between two or more languages when they are having a conversation. Code switching is a very clever way to talk to one person and then switch to a different language with another person. After one of my language arts lessons, I was interested in learning more about Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, somebody who we discussed in our lesson. So we decided to dig deeper. Cortez is a code switcher because she grew up in the Bronx, a neighborhood in New York City where many cultures interact with each other. And many people criticize her for code switching because she is a Latina and not a person of color. And the audience think there is only one way to talk, standard English. When I was researching Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, I found one of her code switch sentences that she used in one of her famous speeches. I'm proud to be a bartender. Ain't nothing wrong with that. I found this line on a site called The Atlantic. This sentence that she used, used interested me because I was surprised that she was criticized for using that one sentence that one time. People should not criticize people of color or even somebody of their own kind when they code switch because they do it themselves too, but they just don't realize it. Here's an example of somebody speaking to two different people in two different ways. If my friend came up to me and said, sup, and then his teacher came up and he said, hello, that's what code switching really is, because he just suddenly changed the way he is talking from black vernacular to standard English. And in conclusion, our country has a lot of immigrants from around the world, and they all talk in different ways. And that's why code switching is the future of language. Thank you. Your Honor, history has indicated this issue is decades old. To help show this point, I will now call several witnesses to stand. First, to call to first to call to the stand, the gods and masterminds, Mikkel Evans and Lizzie Wiggin. <laughs> Okay. 
education as in high school. One month later, on October 1st, 1954, a white mob broke out in disapproval of people like me learning side by side with whites. As I entered school, me and my nine other friends were bombarded. Blacks not allowed! Blacks not allowed! We were harassed, pushed to the ground, called racial slurs. Some of my friends were even beat. 500 white supremacists, students, and protesters gathered at Southern High School just for me and my nine other friends to get out of there. Blacks not allowed! Blacks not allowed! As I entered school, that's all I heard. Blacks not allowed! But when I came around the corner, the white football team captain and white student council president protected me and my other friend from the white mob. That day, six arrests were made, one being 24-year-old Jack Zimmerman. He was detained after he struck my 14-year-old friend, Leon Thompson. Hey, get me out of here! Hey! Then, as nearly as 1,000 anti-integrationists surrounded Southern High School, 50 police officers in the vicinity were able to keep things largely under control. Throughout the next week, many protests, rallies, and marches sparked many of which led by white supremacist leader, Brian Bowles. Bowles fought for segregation. I, Brian Bowles, the leader of the National Association for the Advancement of White People, urge that you, parents of white children of the future, boycott Southern High School and others of the Baltimore school system. On October 4th, Bowles led a rally against desegregation in schools in Baltimore. My daughter will never attend a school with Negroes as long as there's a breath in my body and gunpowder will burn. On October 4th, Bowles led a rally. Almost 2,000 students and adults joined Bowles. He recruited members for his organization and charged a $5 membership fee. Black's not allowed! Black's not allowed! It would be a lie for me to tell you that Southern High School greatly affected the broader movement. If anything, it exposed the racism happening in Baltimore and the protests in integration schools caused white flight to occur. White parents took their kids out of schools because of black children and removed their families from neighborhoods so they wouldn't be zoned to the same place. White flight is one of the main reasons our modern day independent school system is a thing. This is not safe for us anymore. We have to get out of here now. White parents also took their kids out of schools because of the unsafety caused by protests and riots. White enrollment in public schools began to decrease at this time by 2,000 students per year for the next 20 years. Thank you. Match point. What are you doing? Just playing a tennis match, officer. No harm done. No harm done. You're under arrest. For what? For breaking segregation laws and disorderly conduct. Is this Nazi Germany or America? You had no reason to arrest. I was just upholding the park segregation policy. No matter what the policy was, I would still defend the park. How's the process been going? It's going pretty good. There was 24 people arrested in all. There was 13 coloreds and 11 whites. 
we're releasing them on a $26 bail because this protesting is giving us bad press. have just come in from Memphis, Tennessee. Martin Luther King Jr. has been assassinated. Yesterday he was impacting life for the greater. Today he is dead. That is the Daily Report from Memphis. Back to you, Rob. Of course it has to be the most influential person of our race that was assassinated. Honey, you know I can't just sit here and do nothing. I am taking action as soon as I can. Don't worry about me. Two days later. I created what may have been one of the greatest riots in Baltimore, lasting for four days and through three nights. The first piece of glass I broke was one of the starters of the Baltimore riots. I did it into the fashion hat shop. We don't want a wrong mistake to end in death, we chanted. As we covered over 30 miles in ground, our chance attracted police who brutalized us until some of us dropped dead. Over what seems like a long period of time, Baltimore experienced something unlike they had before. We had started something that went down in history and it changed Baltimore. Over 7,000 of our people were injured and luckily no more than seven were killed. Our actions provoked Cherry Hill Shopping Center fires, fire, burn, fire bombs at the Tavern on Park Heights, tax account office vandalization, debris fire at Faya and Paca, and many other attempted fires. The government enforced the National Guard on standby the next day 
12 o'clock hits and our first peaceful gathering occurred for the memorial of Martin Luther King Jr. And two hours later, the city was at peace, but not for long. Three hours later, I broke the first piece of glass and created an outbreak on Gay Street, which back then was known as a ghetto area. The district police officers swarmed us, but we soon broke free when there were reports of a looting at a local dry cleaner, which led to many other lootings. Other fires sparked one another to keep firing. Approximately three people died, 100 arrested, 70, 70 injured, 250 fire alarms all happened on the first day. The second day arrived and we all struck at midnight, not acknowledging the curfew. Our crowd and violence is declared ugly. The second day was one of the worst. With 400 looting, 700 businesses were robbed, Baltimore was invaded by federal troops, 230 injured, 200 fires, 1,250 people were arrested. Our actions took place over the next three days. By the third day is over, Baltimore lost eight to ten million dollars from everything we had destroyed. On the last day, the federal government announced that, ba that Baltimore would lose $345,000 in tax revenues. Our city was affected by this enormous riot, but we fought for what was right and stood up for what we believed in. Thank, Thank you. you. And Black Panther Party was founded on October 15, 15, 1966, Oakland, California. E.P. Newton was the founder of Black Panther Party. And the Black Panther Party created the Black Power Fist, which looks like this. I've made a 3D print of the Black Panther Party Fist. Panther Party has worked on it. You see it? I decided to learn and discover about the Black Panther Party because there is a movie called Black Panther. Now I was wondering if I had to do anything with the Black Panther Party, and it did. And in the film Black Panther Party, there's a character named Killmonger. And he wants to take back what White stole from him and use weapons to fight back. Black Panther Party wanted to do this. They, um, they wanted to help fight and protect black neighborhoods from Jim Crow laws and police brutality. And they often displayed weapons and had shotguns on them. And in my research, I did not find any evidence of them using the shotguns. And what I did as the passing around a 3D print of the Black Panther Party, what I did was create that. And this is the Black Panther.
Through this crusade, we'll prove we can be strong. It's time to make her story hand in hand and choose our rightful jobs whom they belong. We wish that thee can keep an open mind. Thou shalt do rightful deeds and persevere. Hither we may not cheer, anon thee'll find that we as sterling leaders shall appear. As thou wilt understand us, thou wilt see we girls are sterling legends, fairly. Thank you. Lady Baltimore's school system suffers from extreme inequality, especially towards neurodiverse students. To show how this, neuro this seriously affects people, here is the greatest person in the universe, Ella Cunningham Murray, with how children feel in these schools. Okay, so what I did for this is I wrote several poems, and uh, it was really fun to play around with it because uh, I could be tricky in my writing and I could write things different ways so that if you just read it flat out, it has one meaning, but if you think differently, then it has another meaning. So I thought that was pretty cool how I did this. So an example of one of these poems uh, is called A Poisoned Mind. And the reason why I'm projecting it is because I'm gonna read it line by line forwards and I'm gonna read it line by line backwards and it's gonna have a different meaning, okay? Because people think differently, this poem is seen different. This is not okay. Neurodiversity is a problem people say. I don't understand when someone thinks differently than me. Is there something wrong with the fact I say I don't think these people think right? When they say all people are different and it's okay, I say their minds are poisoned. The people say I don't want to learn with them, have the right idea. They know who thinks right. When people think differently, this poem is seen differently. So that's basically saying neurodiversity is a bad thing, but then if you read it backwards, this poem is seen differently when people think differently. Know who thinks right. They have the right idea. I don't want to learn with them, the people say. I say their minds are poisoned. All people are different, and it's okay. When they say, I don't think these people think right, I say, is there something wrong with the fact someone thinks differently than me? I don't understand when people say neurodiversity is a problem. This is not okay. This poem is seen differently because people think differently. So it's a positive message reading it backwards, but you have to think differently to find it. So, and then my next one is a haiku because I decided to do different types of poems. So if you think of this poem, it didn't print fully on this, so I'm just gonna read it off of this. If you think of this poem in a different way, it will have new worth. So you can see there that I highlighted some colors. So if you just read the colors that are highlighted, the words that are highlighted, I think in a different way. So that's what it says. So yeah. Uh, next poem, it doesn't have anything different. It's a basically I learned this kind of poem last year. You take the last, the third and last lines, and you put them on the next lines. This doesn't have any hidden messages, but I wrote it anyways because I needed minimum five. Okay, so, I am not stupid. I am mentally stable. Stupid is what the hypocrites say. Mentally stable, I am perfectly fine. Is what the hypocrites say okay? I am perfectly fine, no need to worry. Okay, I might learn different, no need to worry. Everyone's different. So, and then this is an acrostic. It's called People of the World, and across it's People of the World, so. People. Everyone on the same planet. Proud beings, learning the way they can. Everyone doing it differently. Of course, few accept the differences. These people have set a normal, even though there is no such thing. Why is our world in the right for looking at neurodiversity and not seeing ourselves? Okay, and then this next one, there's the second to last one, it's called I Went to School Today. No hidden message, but I did need to write another one, so. I went to school today, but not like you. 
I tried to find a job the other day, but they picked you. I went to class last period, but I didn't go with you. I'm going to lunch now, but I won't see you. I fell on the playground last Monday, but it wasn't an accident, and I can't explain to you. I went to the nurse's office at 12.53, but I'm not sick of illness. I'm sick of me. So, and then the last one is another haiku. I know the answer, so why don't you call on me? And what's so funny? It's basically a teacher laughing at a student for thinking differently. Thank you. 